Calvary Church High Desert. This is the day that the Lord has made. Wait a minute. Good morning, Abundant Living Family Church High Desert. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We woke you up this morning. We need to give him praise today. We're going to praise him. And you guys, praise him with us. Amen. Come on, y'all. Y'all got to wake up. I know it's early. I know we had that spring forward. Why don't y'all spring forward to the altar right here? Hey, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We love to call your name. It's something we cannot explain. That happens when we proclaim your great name, your great name. We love to call your name. It's something we cannot explain. We cannot explain. That happens when we proclaim your great name, your great name. We love to call your name. It's something God explain. We cannot explain. That happens when we proclaim your great name.
set free when I call. When I call your name. Say when I call your name. When I call your name. I get my shifting when I call. When I call your name. I get my breakthrough when I call. When I call your name. Say when I call his name. When I call your name. Say when I call his name. When I call your name. I get my shifting when I call. When I call your name. My breakthrough when I call, when I call your name, say when I call his name, when I call your name, say when I call his name, when I call your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, hey, hey. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. We thank you for another opportunity just to praise your name. There's power in your name, Lord. We thank you for your power, Lord. We give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. Let's just call on his name right now. Jesus. 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 We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. to fall Jesus 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 there is Jesus. 
You guys know the name of Jesus is the most powerful name. Yes, it is. Come on, come on, let me hear you. How many of y'all know the name of Jesus is the most powerful name? How I many you know sometimes you can be in so much pain, you can have so much going on that you can only get out one word. And, and if you're going to just use one word, don't one waste word. your words. Yes. So if, if you are going through, you have some struggle going on, you need some clarity, you need some healing, you just call on the name of Jesus. Amen. And when you call on the name of Jesus, you have all heaven's resources that are available to you. Oh, now if you believe that, come on, lift your hands and give Jesus a shout. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, lift your hands. Praise your Lord. Lift your hands. Jesus. Come on, sing to the Lord one more time. and privilege to the name of Jesus, Father. Father, we use names very flippantly sometimes, but the name of Jesus is holy. The name of Jesus 
is sacred. The name of Jesus is powerful, God. And so it is a privilege that we can use that name when the enemy comes. It's a privilege we can use that name when we're sick. It's a privilege we can use that name, Father, for our children, for our family, God, for our spouses, God, for our relationships. We are thankful that we can use the name of Jesus. And when we use that name, we believe that there is power. So we honor you and we thank you, God. Father, we lift up all these people, God, in these other nations, Father. You told us nation will rise against nation. But, Father, the refugees, the children, and the women, they don't have anything to do with governmental decisions sometimes. But, Father, they're the ones suffering. So we pray for supernatural aid from heaven, that angels are dispatched and released, Lord God, for these babies and these women and these children, God, and these people that have lost everything. We thank you, God, that we are coming to the end times, and you told us exactly what would happen. But when it happens, it's hard for us to handle. So today, we pray for them because we're so blessed still in this country, God, that we can come and lift our hands and worship you. So we honor you and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Come on, give God a shout today. Andy's playing with my butt. Okay, you good? Come on, give Jesus a shout. Amen. All right. How's everybody doing today? You all right? Huh? You're alive? Come on, you're here, right? Come on, give God a shout. Y'all got to do better than that. God is great. Amen. All right, all right. We want to welcome you to Abundant Living Family Church. Hi, Desert, the longest name of churches. And we appreciate you being here today and worshiping God with us today. So we want to also start off with our creed. If you're a visitor here today, uh, we just want to see your hand. You don't have to say anything, but we do want to acknowledge you because we know you have a lot of different choices to come and worship and come to church. And you came to be a part of our abundant family today. So lift your hand. Let me see here. Any visitors here today? Anybody? Your first time here at the church. Anybody? 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 Oh, we got to do better. Where, who, where, 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 where? I can't see. I can't see nothing. I got these TV lights. I still can't see. So whoever that is, what's up? <laughs> All right. So if you are visiting here, we have our Abundant Living Creed, and we want you to know that we love God. But these are the things that our church is built on. This is our focus. And so put your hand over your heart. You can stand if you would like, but you don't have to because you've been standing for the last 20 minutes. All right. So let's do our Abundant Living Creed. On the count of three, one, two, three. We are Abundant Living, and we receive the life of Jesus. Our families, our friends, our community will know about his life. We will experience abundant prayer. We will provide abundant care. We will pursue abundant health. We will increase through abundant wealth. We will love in our abundant families, and we will commit to abundant service. We are abundant nation, and we will know him and make him known. Come on, give him a shout. Give him a shout today. All right, all right, all right. So, how's everybody doing? You all right? Hey, you smell good. Or is that me? <laughs> is that you, mama? Huh? What you wearing today? The same thing you wore last Sunday. My mom is so consistent, right? I can just give her the same present every Christmas, and she opens it up like she's surprised. <laughs> same thing. All right. So, here we go. Um, how many of you guys are ready? We're going to stay in our Bible series. How many of y'all learn the stuff about the Bible? Come on. Come on. Two people. Hmm. So we did James chapter 1. We did Romans chapter 12. Last week, we did Psalms 23. So I wanted to stay, James, in the book of Psalms today. And uh, this might be my last one because I'm kind of feeling something else, but I don't know. But I want to talk about a psalm that everybody reads. It's kind of like Psalms 23. Um, that everybody um, quotes, and they call it the prayer of protection. 
And I want to break it down, and I want to really drill down into some things that I think are going to really help us in our walk with Jesus Christ. So today, we are going to do Psalms 91. How many of y'all familiar with Psalms 91? Come on, powerful. The prayer, they call it the prayer of protection. Oh, I got a clicker. The computer people back there are going, oh, click yourself. <laughs> All right. I'm 55. I'm old. I have brain farts, you guys. All right. Here we go. The, oh, if you're older than 55, you're gifted. I heard all the seniors go. <laughs> I love you, Miss Peggy. So the book of Psalms is amazing and inspirational. I encourage you to read and study the entire book. Today we're going to walk through the 91st chapter of Psalms and discover why some Christians experience God in very different ways. So before we get into this, Pastor Kim, I want to, I want to kind of set a stage a little bit. First of all, uh, most people think that David wrote the 91st Psalm. How many of y'all think that? If you're like all deep Christian stuff, you like get into the authors. Like one and a half person. So why am I making this point? But Moses is, is attributed with this psalm. How many of y'all knew that? Oh, another one person. So if you read it, you've just got all this pestilence stuff and different things. And sometimes it can be confusing, Tanya, because the reference, if you think it's David, you're thinking about David and Goliath, and you're thinking about wars and different things like this. But if you attribute the book to Moses and look at Moses, Moses went through what? The exodus of what? Egypt, where there was what? Pestilence, any, all kind of different, bigger things. So now that you know Moses is the author of this, of this chapter and this um, book, well, this, yeah, this chapter, it gives you a little bit more clarity about what God is talking about. Now, this is very, very important, and I want to say this. So I don't want anybody to kind of get offended, but I, I want to say this to you. Um, one of the reasons unbelievers have a problem with church and with Christians, Bernard, and with God is because they see an imbalance inside of Christianity. Okay, let me back up. So if you look at the Muslim religion, they act the same. You see the Hindus, they act the same. We're the only group, we have the truth, and we act crazy. <laughs> yes or no? Yes or no? You meet one Christian on Monday, you can meet another Christian, Pastor Lou, on Tuesday, meet another one on Wednesday, meet another one on Thursday. By Friday, you don't want to meet no more. Either they're super spiritual, hyper judgmental, Umpires, not lifeguards. And there's some Christians, you got to be perfect before you come. Please, Mike, stand up. Please. Don't ever go to St. Mary's unless you're completely well and completely healed and don't need any health care. Do you know that's how most invitations to church feel like? Can't be on drugs. Can't be an alcoholic. Can't be an atheist. Can't be an agnostic. People have different lifestyles, and, and they feel like they can't come to church because that's going to be judged. When it's not our job to judge it, it's our job to place people close to Jesus. And I'm going to show you this right now. And, and so this psalm starts off, and it sets things in. But it explains, let me keep trying to do this, but it explains why there's an imbalance inside of church and inside of Christians. Now, the first two verses, mom, it kicks off, and here's what it does. And this is going to be hard for you and I to understand. It quantifies the place of the Christian because the place the Christian lives in determines how the Christian lives. The place you live in, the state you're in, determines 
how you live. Now, here we go. Tiana, the reason we're all over the place and people can't look at us as a group and find Jesus is because even though we're believers, Pam, we live in different places when it comes to God. So he starts off and says, Miss Margaret, if you are in this place with God, now you ready for this? The rest of the chapter you can have. Uh, if you're not in this place, it will be up and down, random at best, and bumpy. Then when other people see Christians being bumpy, they don't understand how God moves, so it's easy to get mad at God, Eddie, because the Christians said one thing, but their life don't match. And I've never heard a message on this. I've never preached one like this. So today we're going to dig deep, and I'm going to show you why some of you are doing well and why some of your lives suck. Anybody in the last category? Go ahead, admit it. <laughs> and, and, and it has nothing to do with God. It has to do with your position. Two and a half people clap. I'm getting a little better. It was one earlier. So let me give you an example, then we're hitting this scripture. You ready? Let's say I have two children. Let's say I'm rich. And both kids, they're a year apart, Rita. And I say, as long as you're living here, you have all the resources of the house. As long as you live here, you have the protection of the father. As long as you follow the rules and don't trip out, you ain't got to be perfect, but you can't be, you know, tripping out. You got to respect my house. As long as you do that, you have all the resources you need to do what you need to do. One says... I don't like everything, but I'm going to stay. The other one says, I don't like any of these rules. I'm going to go do my own thing. And then they get out, and then they get in trouble, Mom. And when they get in trouble, they want to call and tap the resources. Oh, boy. If you're listening, this should be big. And I say, what were the rules? Stay under my covering. Stay under the shadow, my shadow. But you want to go out and do your own thing, so now you have to pay the consequences and deal with your own decisions. Can I tell you, that's what this whole chapter of Psalms is. If you're under my covering, God says, I got you, and I'm going to show you how he has you. But if you want to come and go, my resources are not consistent. Oh, but it don't have nothing to do with me because I'm a consistent God. I'm a faithful God. What you want to do is obey when it feels good, but not when it doesn't. And you want to tell me what to do, and I'm the one in charge. I'm the creator. I'm the one that run this show. So if you don't like the show, get out of the tent. But don't keep trying to come back and forth asking for stuff where you ain't living right. So I wanted to set it up because when you read it, you might be praying this prayer of protection, but evil still befall you because you're praying from the wrong place. Is that all right? A couple people shouted. Okay. Everybody say the place of the believer. Say it again. The what? The place. The place. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide, that means live, under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my, say my, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. What's the key word jump out? My, my. See, the author, which we believe is Moses, says 
There is this general word called God, and Egypt served God and gods. But when they met my guy, ten plagues hit. When they met my God, he turned off the lights. When they met my God, they met some pestilence. Come on, somebody. When they met my God, the rivers turned to blood. When they met my God, he split the sea. So there's a difference between God and my God. This psalm says the number one thing to get us started, Austin, is this. God better be personal to you and not some generic statement. God has got to be personal. And one of the one of the uh, distractions in Christianity is we like to measure people based on our journey and not their journey with God because the journeys are different. Come on, the timings are different, right? The experiences are different. You don't know why someone is doing something. So stop worrying about what someone is doing and pray that they get reconnected. So that this can be a place everyone can come, but when they come, they find Jesus. Not all the police. My, 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 so he's personal. But he says you have to dwell in the secret place, and watch this. It's telling us that it's a secret key because everybody don't dwell there. Everyone doesn't dwell there. So for some Christians, they know. But for other Christians, Maddie, they don't. It's, it's a secret. Should God actually be a secret? He is to people who don't want to discover him. Can I tell you this? This is not God. Church is not God. A Christian club is not God. This is where you come to be around other people who want to be with God. And because we gather together, God comes. But not always. Pastor Mark, what are you saying? I'm telling the truth. There are churches haven't experienced one miracle. There are churches that haven't experienced any peace. There are churches that are massive and big and on TV, but there's no power. There's no salvation. There's no transformation. This is not God. We have to behave so he wants to come. And this is hard, isn't it? Because none of us want to sit here and say we're misbehaving. But God said, if you come and you dwell under me, you're in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, one thing that's important, God is Jesus. Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God. So please listen. What does it mean to dwell under the shadow of the Almighty? See, Christians read stuff and say stuff, but then we don't break down the mechanics so people don't know how to do stuff. What does it mean to be under the shadow of the Almighty? Somebody tell me. Huh? Now, I'm not doing an example. What does it mean? I'm under the word more than I'm under people. I'm under the word more than I'm under people's opinion. That, that my hat is the word of God. I am under the shadow of the Almighty because to cast a shadow, you got to be next to the object that the light is trying to get around. Ah. And, and we substituted this place for being under and next to God. And if you're not next to actually God, then there is no shadow. And if there is no shadow, then verse 1 and verse 2 cancel the believer for the rest of the verses all the way to 16. Now, I know this ain't entertaining, but it's mechanical. 
So why is my life as a believer worse than some of my friends who are unsaved? How come my girls are having a ball? How come my dudes are having a ball? And I'm struggling, I'm tithing, but I'm broke, I'm this, and I'm that. And today I'm going to explain it. And I hate to say it, I hate to be so abrupt, but you already know I'm going to be that. Just because you're going to heaven doesn't mean you're living with him down here. Because you and I going to heaven has everything to do with what Jesus did, not your behavior. So you can accept Christ, and Christ can come into your heart, but there can be no transformation. So you still live by your own rules, your own flesh, your own worldly stuff, your own opinions, the opinions of other people, and all of that cancels you out from verse 2 to verse 16 because you're not under the word, you're under your opinion. Okay. If you want to come live with me, there are a whole bunch of conditions. And if you want to live with me, you don't get to argue with me about my rules. You don't get to, oh, you don't get to argue with me about my conditions. Can I tell y'all something? We miss this. We want to go live in heaven, but we don't like his rules, bro. But it's not your house. You didn't put no furniture there. You don't pay no rent in heaven. You want to come stay with me, God says, but you want to live like hell. The last person that lived like hell, he got thrown out. Jesus said, I saw him fall like lightning. The devil said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I, and then he was like, what happened? Jesus said, we don't play that. No, I'm being serious. And I, when we read Psalms 91, we automatically read it for protection, for COVID, for terrorism, for sickness, for disease, and we never are taught to get in the place so you can read it and live it. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not going to spend as much time on the other verses. I wanted to set the stage. If he is not my, 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 it will be up and down, and then people that need him, Miss Peggy, will see the up and downness and feel like it's like every other religion so then they feel like they can choose and still go to heaven. Because everybody's trying to send people to heaven. They're just trying to make up the rules to get there. Everybody say the protection. Did that make any sense? Y'all don't look right. People like, you all right? Okay. The protection. So if I'm in the right place, Kendra, if, that, if we have two kids, one goes out, live in the street, so stuff happens. One stays home, so they're under the protection. When I set my alarm, my kid is protected. Come on, come on, come on. When I set my alarm, my other son is not, or my other daughter, they're not protected. Why? They're not in my house. They're not under the shadow of their dad. So, so there's not a security, a level of security for the one outside of my presence as there is for the one inside. Now, just because the one inside doesn't mean they're not going to go through issues. But guess what? It's easier for them to run up the steps and say, Daddy, than for somebody down in San Bernardino to try to hit me up when the police got him. Bow. That's not a true story. Surely he shall deliver you. From the snare of the fowler. See, watch, Kendra. These are all these Egyptian references that if you don't know it's Moses, you, it, they don't really make sense. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, God, and under his wings you shall take refuge. You shall live. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. I'm going to come back to that one. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night. Watch, watch this balance. You shall not be afraid, Pastor, of the terror by night. Nor are the arrows that fly by day. Ukraine's getting bombed day and night. And it causes terror when you woke up out of your sleep. But they're also getting bombed during the day. Now watch. Nor are the pestilence that walks in darkness, back to night. Nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday, back to daytime. Verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. We're going to deal with this. But it shall not come near you only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked now i'm gonna go to eight and come back up you ready 
Because eight is a quantifier. Now, here's this thing. Only with your eyes will you look and see the reward of the wicked. Can I tell you the quickest way, Vic, to get out of God's covering? Is for you to fight your enemies. What? The quickest way to move spaces is for you to fight your enemies. But Pastor Mark, I don't understand your words because they're my enemies. Mm -hmm. And vengeance is God. He will repay. Proverbs 16, 7 says, if a man's ways please the Lord, Margie, he will make even his enemies at peace with him. Psalms 23, come on, I'm going to keep going, right? He prepared a place for me in the presence of my enemies. He prepares a table, which means I can actually sit down and eat in the presence of my enemies and people that are attacking me. So watch this. Verse 8 says this, you guys, you dwell with me. You're under my protection. If you fight the people fighting you, you act like you don't trust I'll fight for you. This is heavy. When you don't forgive people that mess with you, and when you don't move on from people that mess with you, you keep a fight going that God's trying to end. Oh, what? What? Forgive them. I'll forgive you and handle them. I don't want to forgive them. You're keeping something going that God's trying to end. Come on, y'all don't understand what I'm saying to you. So, so then with your eyes, you don't see the reward of the wicked because you're trying to be the punisher. But if you punish them, he should punish you. Because we can find someone else that you're their enemy. Oh. See, you might have enemies, but you're somebody else's enemy. This ain't going good. You ought to see people's face. God said, I got rules, Mom. Trish, I got rules. So I'm telling you, you're under my protection. You're under my refuge. You're in my fortress. I don't care if stuff's coming at day and stuff's coming at night. I don't care what it is. As long as you're under my protection, I got this thing handled, and I need you to believe that I'm your God. Remember my, 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 my? And I got this thing handled, and when you try to handle it, your heart changes. Oh, see, you don't want that. You don't want that. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When you try to handle it, your heart changes. Because I didn't equip your heart to hate. I didn't equip your heart to exact judgment. Because you don't know what you don't know. I know, and when I do it, you don't reap. When you fight, you reap. So step back. And you'll see the reward of the wicked as long as you don't keep jumping in the ring trying to be a tag team partner because the last time I checked, I didn't tag you in. Uh. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. The place I'm supposed to be, Melinda, this is supposed to guide me not my emotions. Nancy, this is supposed to guide me, not my revenge. This is supposed to guide me, not what I think is going on. My job in the whole song is to stay in the right place. Does this make sense? I'm trying to say to you today, today, don't just hear me. Forgive when you leave. Some of you have been trapped all your life in pain and struggle and suffering from abuse and neglect and regret, and you are living a life God did not plan for you. God did not see this life for you. But you have a form of godliness, but you deny the power thereof. The Bible says you can have a form of godliness. You can talk godly, look godly, smell godly, whatever that is. Walk godly, but you're denying the power that I have to heal you. And the reason you're doing what you're doing, the reason your children are doing what they're doing, is because there is a pain that I would love to come and be the antibiotics for you. But you're not in the right place. And you've substituted in America, church, for a real relationship with me. 
I can tell you a lot of people marry, but there's not a real relationship. Sometimes it's a marriage of convenience, but it's not real. Just look straight ahead like if you're sitting here with somebody. <laughs> Where the believer should live. Number nine, notice chapter one and two. Where, what's it about? Where you what? Live. Three through eight comes and says, now check this out. If you live there, I got you day and night, right? Leave your people to me. Then he comes back with what? Where you should live again. What is he doing? Sean is repeating a principle throughout the psalm so that you don't grab one piece of it and not get the other piece because you move. Oh, you don't hear me? You didn't hear me? Okay, please listen. Psalms 91, 1 and 2 says, here's your place under God. Then he talks about all the problems that happen in life. Come on. Pestilence. Arrows by day. Destruction by night. And you know why they come back at 9 and 10, 10 and start talking about living with God again? Because God knows people move because of pain. He knows, he can tell you one time, Frank, hey, live under the shadow of the Almighty. But when life hit, people move. Wait a minute, why did God do that? Wait a minute, why did God allow that? Wait a minute, why am I going through this? Wait a minute, why did so-and-so pass away? Wait a minute, why am I struggling with this? And so God comes back and says, hey, hey, come back, focus, focus. I know we had pestilence. I know we had arrows. I know we had destruction. Come back, come back, come back. Come back and live. And he reminds him. Just because you have struggled, this is really what this psalm is. Can you love me while you struggle? Because you sure love me while I'm blessing you. Can you love me while I'm protecting you? Because when I protect you, it means I love you. You're switching it up and getting twisted in the head that just because I have to protect you, you feel like something is wrong with you or me. When there is an enemy of me and you, and his name is the devil, he is relentless. I'm trying to get you not to open doors so he can drive a truck through. Struggle, pain, suffering is part of the fallen kingdom. And it fell because humans didn't trust him. Mr. Wendell, so good to see you. So he comes back. Because you have made, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, this is the author talking, even the most high, your dwelling place. Now watch, 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 Maurice, watch. There's a flip here. The author's talking to us. Because you guys that abundant have made the Lord, who's my refuge, my. So my God is your God. But don't get it twisted. If you decide for not to make him your God, oh, he's still my refuge. You can't let your faith be, a, be hit by other people's experience. God might be calling you on two different journeys. I know people who, are, who get together and, and are in a relationship, and God is dealing with one of them very strongly, and the other one he's dealing with too, but the other one don't want to hear because the other one like where it's at. And, and it might cause a split. You say, but if God loved me, why would he cause a split? Because God's trying to put both of you in eternity. And you're not good for each other. We love each other. You better shut up. Slap. I slap you. I know you love each other. I see people that love snakes too. I was watching the Nat Geo thing and a woman had a big snake. Started sleeping with the snake in the bed. Took the snake to the vet, said, he don't eat. The vet said, he don't eat. She said, mm-mm, he stopped eating. It's been two months. 
that say, hello, he can set it up for a snack. <laughs> this is true. But she loved the snake. Let the snake sleep in the bed. Family came over. A couple weeks later, she gone. He, he, he emptied himself, wrapped her up, and he ate her. But she loved the snake. So here's the moral to the story. Now the two are one. <laughs> Just because you love something doesn't mean it's right for you. And, and please don't measure right by natural. Please measure right by eternal. Please measure right by eternal. Now, if you want to go to hell, then okay. Just stay together, fornicate. Well, yay, yeah, do it. Yay. Yeah. Do it, right? But coming home from yard house, somebody hits you, run over you, and you both end your life and get thrown into eternity, you don't get to go to heaven being a fornicator. And see, when I talk like this, now people on Facebook are going to cancel me. Uh, well, I didn't make the rules up. God says, I don't want fornication in heaven. I don't want sin in heaven. What you guys call pure is nowhere near pure to me. You guys are sick of hearing it, but I'm going to keep saying it because it was genius. Okay? If you're new, this is just your pastor. So in the summer, about 10 years ago, what? almost about 10 years ago, I got some dog poop, and I went outside here, and I put it in a thing of water, and I let it get all warm and shaky and nasty, and, and I brought it into the church, and I took the lid off and let everybody smell it, and everybody was like, pastor's insane. Then I had a cup of ice water up here, and I poured the ice water in the cups, and I let everybody have a cup, and everybody was drinking the ice water, and it was so nice and tasty. And then I said, hey, most people think that God is unfair because he would let one sin in heaven. Everybody said, yeah, yeah. So I, I took a dropper, you know the little turkey droppers? I took a dropper of poop, and I put one drop in a big old pitcher, and I shook it up, and I said, does anybody want anything to drink? And nobody wanted nothing to drink. I said, ho, 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 it's one drop. Just one sin. Listen. God has a right to keep his thing pure. God has a right to keep his house holy. So, so there's no excuse when he sends the, the answer to your sin. Jesus lets him die in our place, puts our sin on him, and then says, if you believe I did that, I'll forgive you, clean you up. And when I look at you, I look through Jesus so you can come live here because it's not based on your behavior. It's based on my son's death. So you can come here. But if you don't want to follow the rules, you don't get to live there. You guys, I know this ain't the happiest message. You're like, I should have stayed home. Half the people did, look. Almost done. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Oh, that's where I, that, Pastor Mark, that's why I don't like y'all preachers. That's why I don't like you church people, you Christians, you knuckleheads. Y'all got stuff in that Bible that ain't true. All right, look, are you going to tell me no evil shall befall you? Man, I can sit down with you, Pastor Mark, talk to you for three days, Mike, and tell you all the evil that's befallen me right now. Nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Mark, I had COVID twice. Is COVID a plague? Yep. What you mean no evil shall come near my dwelling? God is talking spiritually about spiritual danger. He is not talking about natural danger. And I'm going to prove it in a minute. In the natural danger, he'll deliver you if you're at home. Oh. The godly protection for the believer. But Pastor Mark, that's an error because we said protection up above. Uh-uh. There's protection and then there's godly protection. What are you talking about? There's protection, Kendra, and then there's godly protection. Let's see. For he shall give his angels. Oh, there it is. Ah, oh, there it is. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Where have we heard that? Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. The devil in the wilderness with Jesus said, why don't you throw yourself off? The Bible says what? That the angels will keep charge of you. 
Can I tell you something that's crazy? Are y'all ready? The devil believed the scriptures and we don't. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, you shall trample underfoot. Now, listen to me. I know it's a lot today, but listen. There's two levels of protection. Some people don't need this level because you ain't a missionary. Where are you going? Where are you going to tread on a lion and a cobra? Target? Uh, you in Apple Valley? You target? Bernard, come home. Tracy, you ain't gonna believe it. I was treading on serpents and scorpions. <laughs> Did you go to Africa, Bernard? No, I was at Target. You and I don't need this. This is missionary type stuff. You see angelic uh, restoration and angelic intervention when you are really on the battlefield, when you are really in danger. God says like Paul. Paul was on a missionary journey, got bit by a snake, Mr. Frank. He shook it off. That's what this is talking about. He has no doctor, no St. Mary's, no antibiotic snake. A snake come, boom, and God said, you are in my will right now. I'm going to handle these snakes and lions and adders and cobras, and even though they bite you, their venom will not bother you because you are out there doing stuff that my Christians at Target ain't doing. They're worried about being bitten by live animals in the jungle witnessing. You're worried about your coupon don't work. There's different types of protection. Coming to the end, the comfort. Are y'all getting this? If I'm not doing big stuff, Eddie, I don't need big protection. Come on, y'all. You up there, Lord, send your angels. I'm going to work. <laughs> what? You work in the office? Yeah, but I got to type. <laughs> if you do all that, you get comfort, and we're done. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Look, look, Pam. He wraps up the song. He has set his love upon me. Where? Verses 3 through 8, Kendra, where all the pain was, where all the arrows were, where all the struggle was. So you want, you want to know the point today? God says, I want to see, and the reason I test you, not tempt you. The reason I test you is I want to see if you will set your love upon me and keep it there. Or will you get in... Uh, Become a critic in the crisis and complain instead of confess. Will you become a critic in the crisis and just complain to me instead of speak my word? So, because he has set his love upon me, now God is talking, therefore I will deliver him, period. From what? COVID? From what? From what? Poverty? From what? Pain from what? Incest from what? Abuse from what? He just says he'll deliver you. You and I have to believe, like the devil believed, that's why he used the scripture, that God will deliver us, but it, it's conditional. It, it, it's a conditional thing. Because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, not fuss at me. He shall call upon me, not use my name in vain. GD this. Come on, y'all. You can't say GD and then call on his name. Come on. Because he will call upon me. And then I will answer him, God said. I will be with him in trouble. Can you look at this? Where? In trouble. He don't promise us a rose garden. That's a song. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him. Look, and women, I will deliver him and honor him. Here it is. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Do y'all know what long life means? Oh my gosh, you know what long life means? Long life means ordained life. Oh my gosh. We had the home going service yesterday for Miss Reese. It was the most amazing thing. But I've never ever got a word like this to give to a, to give to a family, and I'm going to give it to you in close. We're done. It changed my whole perspective about death because I know some of you have lost loved ones, especially during COVID. 
When it says long life, mom, it is not long in terms of duration. It is in terms of quality. And it's in terms of what God ordained on your birthday. Now, I'm going to shorten yesterday's message in a minute. Are you ready? This will give you some peace. You're not from here. Oh, I'm from Pomona. We're sorry. No, I'm playing, Vic. <laughs> I'm playing. You're not from here. You ready? Jeremiah 1, 4, and 5. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. I called and ordained you a prophet unto the nations. God told Jeremiah. He says, I knew you before I formed you. So God knew us before he formed us. Before the egg and sperm hit, it was like, what? And you came. He says, I knew you. You ready? Now watch. I'm lending you to earth to bring me more people. But I, just as much as I love you, I want to be with you. Oh, y'all don't want me to fool with this. Because, see, we love people, but we need a break. We married, we're like, can you go and take a day or two? <laughs> Look straight ahead right now. God says, I don't need a break. So I'm going to give you a break and let you be born. But on your birth date, I am setting your death date. And no disease, no car accident, no murder, no sickness has nothing to do with your death day. I've ordained a time for you to be down there, but I want you to come home. Evan, the problem is everyone doesn't come home. Saddam Hussein was supposed to come home. Hitler was supposed to come home. See, now this is getting past your head, right? Mass murderers. Charles Manson was supposed to come home, but they did not come home because when they got down here, they made up their own rules. We are lended down here for a moment, and that time is ordained. And he says, if you live with me down while you're down there or in my presence, I will ordain a life that will satisfy you. I will show you my salvation, and my salvation is why you can come back home. Ah, it was grace and mercy that you started off with me, but I need you to respond to me. I need you to dwell with me. I I need you to be with me. Why? So I can bring you back. I sent my son Jesus so I can bring you back. So you can't do everything. You can't live any kind of way. You can't make up the rules when you get down there. I need you to come back. And I will show you my salvation. And I will save you. And I will deliver you. I will get you through struggle. I will get you through pain. By the name of my son, Jesus Richard, I will bring you back. I will bring you back. But you've got to come home. Bring them with your Panama Jack hat. I love Maurice. He got my spirit. I will show you my son Jesus. If you respond to him, it'll be a total transformation. You'll follow the rules. There's a reason for it. And then you get to come back home. That is Saul's night. Come on, give Jesus a shout. Come on, you can do better than that. Come on, lift your hand. Y'all enjoying the Bible? You enjoying the Bible? I hope so. I'm trying to get you to read. If you're going to leave here, those of you that signed up, we have an Old Testament, New Testament Sunday school classes going today. I'm so excited. You're going to be able to learn the Bible and be under the covering and the shadow of it, and it's going to transform you, and it's going to help you transform others. Remember when you leave here today, you and I have to be a good example. You guys, we have to be a good example. This is an eternal thing, and I know you're caught up in your life and the gas and the bills and everything, 
but, but your life could end tomorrow. And you'll be hurled into eternity and you're not going to be able to change the rules. There's a place in Hawaii that a lot of people like to visit. And the thing that makes it unique is there's only one way to get there. And a tour guide has to take you there. But there's literally only one way to get there by land. Some people, when it comes to God, Eddie, they want to say, well, I don't like that way. I want to make up another way. The problem is there's no other way to get there. There's only one way to get to heaven. If you're watching on Facebook, please listen. To it's through Jesus. Because the reason you can't figure this out is because you're already guilty. The criminal don't get to tell the judge what the sentence is. You and I were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So the only way to get out of this is to be pardoned. Pardon says you're guilty, but I'm not going to let the consequence you deserve come on you. You guys understand that Jesus was a legal transaction from God the Father. I have to judge you. I judge the devil, so I have to judge you. I can't let you off the hook. So because I judged him, I have to judge you. But I'm going to give you a leg up. I'm going to send my son Jesus to pardon you for your sin. But if you say you believe him and you say you love him, then he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, not make up new ones. And a lot of you sitting here today have a knowledge of Jesus, have a knowledge of God, but you have to be honest. You've been making up the rules as you're going on, going along. And you can't do that. You say, Pastor Mark, you're just too hard and too narrow. Narrow is the way to heaven, that's why. Broad is the way to hell, so I will not be a broad preacher. <clears throat> I'm not going to be an inclusion church. Well, what does that mean? That means that everybody come and everybody get guaranteed a trip to heaven because they come here. I'm not the gatekeeper. I'm the messenger. And if you're not right and I'm not right, you're going to hear it here. Now, be strong enough to hear it and then make a decision. Don't run. Jesus says, come to me if you're heavy laden. I'll give you rest. You don't have to have no preparation in this next moment to give your life to the Lord Jesus and say, Lord, I'm sorry. We'll figure the details out later. But eternity is knocking at the door, and you don't know. You know your birth date. The problem is you don't know your death date. Bow your head. I want you to really... Listen and focus. I, I, I really can't lead you to Christ. <clears throat> I'm just a deal closer. God has already been dealing with you. I can't lead you to Christ. I can just close the deal and close the transaction. If you're here and God's been dealing with your heart in this psalm today, kind of said, hey, this kind of explains it. I've, I've been more churchy and religious than I have been in position in relationship. My lifestyle doesn't line up with what the scriptures say, and I know it, but I just like it. But today, I, I feel eternity encroaching. So I need to make a decision today and figure out the details tomorrow. Because the Bible says you're not promised tomorrow. So please listen to my voice today. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, and that means, uh, that, that doesn't mean I know Christmas songs. It means that I know him, that he is my, 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 my Lord and Savior. That's what the song was at Praise and Worship, my Savior. And you know that not because it's a head knowledge, but because it's a heart knowledge and a life transformation. <clears throat> if your life is the same as it was before you knew him, then you have not made the decision yet, even though you feel like you have. Jesus is here today, no questions asked, no holds barred, to forgive you and give you a brand new life and a brand new nature because it's about eternity. If this message in any way penetrated your heart today and you want to make a decision for Christ, remember, details later. I want you to stand to your feet today. It's hard. It's challenging where you go. But you'd rather stand to your feet while you can than bow on your knees before you're cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Pastor Mark, that's why I don't like. You're always talking about hell. 
Okay, we'll stop talking about jail too. And see how many people say, wait a minute, there's no jail? And see how many crimes start happening. That's what happened last summer. I don't care what you say. They knew they weren't going to do no time. So if I don't talk about hell, there'll be more spiritual crimes. Anyone else today? If the message touched you. And let me say this. You don't have to agree to make a decision. I didn't agree with everything my mom said. But I knew if I wanted to stay in her presence, I had to do what she asked me. A lot of people feel like they got to agree with everything. You, you don't. I'll tell you this. Father knows best. That used to be a show. All right. Lift your hands if you're standing to your feet. I want you to repeat after me. Dear Jesus, <coughs> we love you and honor you. And I thank you for the 91st song. I realize it's more about my position than my behavior. My position determines my behavior, not my behavior determining my position. So today, I have an opportunity to change my position, to change my place, bring you into my heart, because you've been knocking. Lord Jesus, as you come in, forgive me of all my sins for breaking the rules and making up the rules. Today, I make a commitment to follow you all the days of my life. And when I fall or make a mistake, you will help me Rise again. I love you because you first love me. Amen. Come on, you can do better than that. This is an eternal thing, an eternal decision. Amen. Come on, let me hear your voice. What's up? Come on, people coming into the kingdom of God is important. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. We love you. And we thank you. If you stood up or you want a deeper relationship with God, I want you to text the word journey. You pull your phone out right now. I want you to text the word journey to 760-706-7562. You will get daily reminders of prayers and scripture, and it will help you walk with your walk with God. It'll help develop that. You text journey to 760, even those of you on Facebook, 706-7562. Amen. Amen. Are y'all excited today to be alive? I know it's tough, but it's a good day and a good time and a good season to be alive. All right. This is our opportunity for giving. Come on, give Jesus a hand clap. Come on, come on. I know you like giving. Chicken is like seafood. <laughs> Gas is $30 a gallon. Can I tell you something? If you want to be inflation proof, make sure you're giving your tithes and your offering. <laughs> You're not giving to a church, you're giving to the kingdom of God, amen? And God keeps track of everything that we're doing. Malachi 3, chapter 10, I mean, chapter 3, verse 10, but, 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 but what the wookie what? Malachi 3, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, says God. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates. He's going to throw them open of heaven and pour out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. 7.9% inflation has nothing on the protection of God for your finances. How many of you know the expenses can go up? It doesn't matter if your revenue goes up. Come on, God is the God that blesses. But if you rob him, then when the, when the expenses go up, they're going to keep climbing and you're going to keep feeling it. I'm going to tell you about something that happened to me in my prayer chair this morning that's going to help and bless you. <clears throat> But we want to give you the opportunity to give. Um, so uh, do I do the pledge first and then they collect it? What do I do? Because I'm really hungry. The pledge first? I'm hungry and my head is going like this. You did give me two pieces of sausage and some cheese. No, that's good. I want a pancakes. What? A sandwich. Right, right. In Jesus' name, pancakes. Okay, anyways. I'm playing. No, I appreciate you, baby. All right, come on, put your hand over your heart. As you get ready to give, we want you to say this pledge, and I want you, as your, uh, if you're a visitor, you don't have to give, by the way. If this is your house, though, we want you to support the house, amen, but visitors don't have to give. All right, on the count of three, one, two, three. Dear Lord, as we give to you today, we know that we will reap later and greater and have favor in famine. 
We thank you for protecting our businesses, providing for our families, and securing our jobs. We praise you for unexpected income, refunds and rebates, deals and sales, and renewed employment opportunities if necessary. In our jobs, we will experience promotions, protection, and over time if we need it. We believe that you will stop the enemy from stealing our money and that it will not be devoured as we become consistent percentage givers. Come on, give him a shout. All right, all right, all right. All right, we want to dismiss our Facebook ushers and, and hostess. You can receive the tithes and offerings and gifts today from them. And we want to dismiss our Facebook audience. We want to say this together on the count of three. One, two, three. We live and we... What they said is different up there. So it's different. So it threw me off. All right. Yay. Bye-bye, Facebook. Come on, y'all. Give Jesus a shout.